Hello everyone. Yes, my name is Christy Williams and I do work in Ukraine. And first I want to welcome you to what is going to be a seminar, a workshop, interaction about the amazing teenage brain. We're going to look at the physiological, emotional, and spiritual side of the brain and what makes teenagers tick. Now, in a spirit of transparency, I do want to warn you that if you are looking for a European neurologist, you have not come to the right place. There is a science network here at ELF. We saw Alexander Fink last night, a very humorous man. He's probably the person you want to go to for some of those questions. I am neither European nor a neurologist. I am American from Chicago. However, for the last 15 years, I've been serving God in Ukraine, in Lviv, Ukraine, working with Josiah Venture, a youth leader training organization. And I love youth in Ukraine very much. Yes, I still live there, so you're welcome to come after. We can talk war stuff. But right now, we're going to focus on young people and uh, young people in general. But, you know, the more I work with teenagers, the more I want to know them. And I want to understand how they work the way they do. And I was taking some classes at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, where they introduced us to this incredible book called The Teenage Brain. And so I very much recommend it. It's by Dr. Frances Jensen. She is a neurologist out of Harvard. Um, she's not a believer. However, um, this is the content from which I took this lecture. And it helped me so much. I'm so thankful. I don't know where I would be in youth ministry, honestly, if I didn't start studying some of these topics. Now, of course, we believe that science is really important. Psychology, psychiatry, neurology, the physical sciences, the medical sciences. However, the originator of the teenage brain is God. And when we look at the Psalms, we see that our brains are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I want to start with that, that we remember that the brain is a fearfully and wonderfully made organ. And although stress and sin and disease and hardship definitely negatively affect the brain. We do live in a broken world. The brain was originally created to be this beautiful place of learning, of memory, of reward, pleasure, and that was God's intention. And as we look at King David and what he wrote, you know, he praises God and he says, your works are wonderful, I know that full well. So I want us to start from a place of believing that God's works in the brain are really magnificent. And now King David wrote this thousands of years ago, and today we are thankful for all of the advances that science has made so that we can better understand looking both from God's perspective as well as what science shows us about the brain. So this is a lecture that I give to high school students in Ukraine. And I usually start with this picture and I ask them, tell me what you already know about the brain. And usually they can say, well, the brain is in two halves. The right half is responsible for creativity, for emotions, singing, dancing, music, etc. And the left brain is more for logic, structure, systematic thought. And then the truth is, is that's about all they can tell me. And that might be you too. That might be all you really know about the brain. That was definitely all I knew before I started looking into this topic. But there's much more we should know. But then in my lecture, I go on to this slide. And I say, okay, let's think about some stereotypes. So what do adults stereotypically think about teenagers? And now the reaction from the Ukrainian young people is always, Adults think we're crazy, adults think we're angry, adults think we're irrational, lazy, overly emotional, and the list goes on and on. And then I ask a follow-up question, and I say, do you think adults like teenagers? And almost always the answer is a resounding no. And so for us, I want us to start here and think, wow, there is an entire generation of young Europeans, the next generation, who are fearfully and wonderfully made by God with the brains that they have, with the struggles and the problems that they have, and they are just waiting 
in their lives for adults who are going to be loving, who are going to come alongside them in their churches, in their schools, in their homes, in their neighborhoods, and who are going to walk with them through what we absolutely believe to be a challenging time in life. Then I show this slide, which is also some more stereotypes about the teenage brain. Here in the picture, we see lots of emotions. We see a sex drive in the back. We see a sleep center in the middle. And then we see a lot of these other colorful pieces, which represent glands and hormones. And now I want to tell you immediately that these are not stereotypes. This is true. Young people are overly emotional. Young people are driven by sex and many other things going on in the back of their brain. They're obsessed with sleep. Their hormones are out of control. But there's still a lot of hope, and that's not a bad thing. It's just showing that, yes, it's really hard to work with young people. Some of you are probably here because you have your own teenagers. Some of you are here because you work with youth. And some of you are here because you yourselves maybe have a teenage brain or a brain that's still developing, and you want to know more about yourself. So we have lots of different things going on here. But one of the purposes of this lecture is to help you gain empathy and grace and love for this age group because there's actually some real physiological reasons why it's hard to work with young people. And we'll start with this picture which shows this little green piece in the very front. It, up there it's written common sense and it's the smallest part of the brain. But let me explain how the brain works and why it's so hard to work with young people sometimes. And it all honestly starts with this Part, we're going to call it the scientific term, which is prefrontal cortex, so the frontal lobe. And let me show you some pictures of the brain. Don't worry, we're not going to go all science here, but this is such a great depiction. So here, although we see 10 brains, there's really five. So each one on top of the other, that's the brain at age 5 age 9, age 13, 17, and 20. Okay, so it's like a top view and a side view going along. Now the goal of the picture for brain development is to have an all blue, let's say, color blue, all blue brain. Now the brain develops from the back to the front. So infant's brain starts at the brain stem and it goes forward, forward, forward until the brain is fully developed. So the goal is to have all of the tissues connected, all of the pathways connected, all of the synapses going and working the way that God intended. Now, there's two interesting things about this, which is that when you look at the 20-year-old brain photos or pictures, images, you would expect probably to see a fully blue brain. Scientists in the past, before MRI technology, where you could take pictures and study the brain, Scientists thought that teenagers were fully developed when their brain was fully sized inside of the skull, which happens between the ages of 16 and 18. And then they also thought that teenagers were fully developed at the end of puberty, which is also the ages of 16 to 18. But then when science allowed us to study the brain deeper with these photos, they realized, wait a second, the brain is fully developed around the age of 25. So one of our biggest problems in society, honestly, is that we start to treat young people as fully formed adults far earlier than they're actually ready. Their brains are still going through a lot of development. And oftentimes, I think that we set the bar too high because we look at an 18-year-old guy and we say he is fully developed. Therefore, his mind, his brain, his cognitive abilities must be altogether, but the truth is they're not. And so we like to think of the brain, it's a, it's a polite term to say it's under construction, okay? So here you see the picture on the right. So think of the brain as under construction, still forming. Now we showed that little green cartoon piece that said common sense, but behind that there's a whole lot of terms that go along with that final executive function. So the prefrontal cortex, once the front of the brain is fully connected, you get a lot of amazing capabilities. But let's take a look at these capabilities and think about a teenager. So by the age of 25, the personality is fully formed. The functions of being a good planner, 
organizer, responsible, those things are working well. The idea of like following through on tasks or making wise decisions. And what about all those emotions? Finally, we get some emotional stability going, impulse control, so the ability to say no, the ability to resist temptation. And then you have these other interesting three last ones, which is self-awareness. Like, I understand how I'm coming across and how you perceive me. Objectivity, not being subjective in your opinion, but being able to see maybe a more neutral way of looking at life and an other-centered point of view instead of an egocentric point of view. So this is an incredible list of 12 of the most advanced functions that we have as adults. But scientists, this Dr. Jensen, Dr. Jensen actually wrote this book because she was a Harvard neurologist who had teenagers of her own. And she said, how can this be that I study brain activity every day of my life, but I don't understand my 16 and 18 year old sons? And so she took, she was, I, she was studying a different part of neurology and she switched to teenage brain development. And that's what um, inspired her to read this, to write this book. But this list of functions are things that oftentimes we expect from a young person and the young person is not able to fully deliver. Now, I want to make sure I'm very clear. This does not mean that your 15-year-old can't be responsible or make a good decision. No, no, no. But as I explain to you how the brain develops, you'll understand why these functions are harder because of this connection in the front and what's actually going on inside of the brain to make that more difficult. But before we do that, I want to talk to you about some maybe emotions. And we'll start with emotions, and then we'll come back to these functions. So here is a beautiful car. It's the famous Italian. I'm American, so we say Lamborghini. Sorry, I know Lamborghini sounds so much more exotic. But here's a wonderful Lamborghini. And I like to compare the teenage brain to this sports car. Because this sports car is super powerful super fast, super capable. However, in its power, it has certain sensitivities or vulnerabilities that can cause it to spin out of control very easily. And it's actually a great analogy. So this little video here is, this car does not have any steering control on it. So this is a professional driver and he is driving as fast as he can, and he's trying to keep the car in line, in order. But as he's moving the steering wheel, you watch it. Look, he did not intend for this to happen, but the next thing you know, the car is spinning out of control. And it's a little bit the same way as a young person who's unable to control their emotions, and there's actual physiological reasons why. But here, he has traction control on. So no matter how hard he jerks the steering wheel from left to right, he's able to keep the car under control. And he's very excited about that. He's like, wow, this is an amazing function. The car can't spin out of control, even if I'm trying to. So imagine this very simple example. 15-year-old girl wakes up, running late from school, walks into the kitchen, opens the cupboard. Oh my God! And everyone in the house is like, what on earth? Someone had drank the last green tea, <laughs> okay? She's crying. She's throwing a tantrum, as we say in English, like a two-year-old. And everyone in the house is like, oh my word, it's a bag of tea, what's your problem? But that's often what happens is that young people have radical reactions, emotional reactions, both girls and guys, and there's actually reason for it. So I want to explain to you what's going on inside. So inside of the brain, there's the amygdala, which is like an emotional control center for the brain. And that's where the emotions exist. Let's just say that's where emotions live, okay? And then you have the pituitary gland, which is where the hormones live. And we know that um, as someone goes through puberty, the hormones are turned on in a heavy way. So you have estrogen, um, progesterone, testosterone. Now, just so you understand, we all have hormones, okay? We all have a pituitary gland, but anyone who is not between the ages of 11 and 17 
Imagine that our hormones are dripping like a bathroom faucet, okay, where water comes out. So the bathroom faucet drips like this, drip, 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 and that's normal hormone flow flowing through all of our bodies. However, at the age of 11, 12, imagine that this bathroom faucet turns on full blast like a fire hose, and it's just spraying hormones out of this place out of control, and it doesn't turn back off until around the age of 17, 18. And that's actually happening in the body. There is no way to turn off that hormone release. And the problem is that the hormones live close to the emotions. So those hormones are constantly emitting their chemicals and it's affecting the emotions, causing young people to be more aggressive, to be more risky, to have more adrenaline flow. And honestly, it's kind of a hot mess between the ages of 11 and 17. But when you talk to people who have children in that age, and provided that the children are on like a regular developmental progression, they say, wow, after the age of like 18 or 19, I felt like I got my child back. I don't know what happened in those seven or eight years. Well, I can tell you what happened after is that that fire hose turned off and the hormone flow was flowing at a normal rate. So when we understand that, it's like, oh, wow. They're, they're having a hard time because these hormones are hitting the emotions and call, causing all of this explosion. But what if we go back to my list here and say, look at number seven, eight, and nine, emotional stability, impulse control and resisting temptation. These are already gonna be hard for a young person because this is how it works. You have an impulse coming in. I wanna teach you about learning, okay? This is how the brain learns. You have an impulse coming into one of five senses, okay? So some kind of stimuli, something coming in. It can come in through the eyes, through the ears, through the nose, through the mouth, through touch. And that's how we learn. Something comes into the brain and then if it's the first time we're experiencing something, the brain makes a connection, like a little connection. If it's not the first time we're experiencing that, the brain starts to grow off like shoots or paths or branches, and that's how learning starts to happen. But, but we eventually create the pathways in our brains, but they don't create overnight. It comes with experience and learning. So your young person may have certain pathways in the brain that are built to get to some of these skills or functions that they need, but they're not very well developed. So if an emotional impulse comes in, like seeing that there's no T, the young person doesn't even realize it, but they have two choices. Either they can go the short path, which is to the emotions, or they can go the longer path, which is to the emotional stability or impulse control. Usually what happens is those pathways aren't formed yet and it's so much easier to have an emotional explosion than to go down the path to get to, oh wait, let's logically look at this. There's no tea today, that's okay. I'll take fruit tea and life goes on. It's just the impulse is there, it's easier to do the short path, the longer paths aren't formed and so we have what we have. Now, there is hope because I want to come back to this, so learning. So this is what I'm talking about. New impulse, synapse happens, repeated impulse, paths, shoots, paths start to form. I have really good news. The teenage brain is at its most ripe time for learning, for growing, for developing. So they are going to learn things faster than at any other age. They are gonna be better at memorizing things, better at picking up new skills, new hobbies, absorbing knowledge. Um, and we as adults want to capitalize on that and help young people develop whatever skills, hobbies, talents, interests that they have. Um, especially um, if they're showing an interest in something, for example, your young person shows that he's interested in chemistry and everyone else in his class is making fun of him because, ah, that's silly, oh, that's dorky or whatever. Say, like, no, as a teacher, you wanna say, hey man, I see you're interested in that. How can we develop that? Because he's gonna learn faster, stronger, and better than any other time of his or her life. 
So honestly, promoting hobbies and promoting skill development. And sometimes we get frustrated with young people because it seems like they're involved in a lot of stuff, sometimes too much stuff. Like today it's this, tomorrow they want to be in the marching band. The next day, oh, I'm done with marching band. I want to do fashion design. And they jump all over, that's okay because the brain is craving knowledge, learning, doing new things, curious about the whole world. So they need to try things. So don't get too exasperated or tired of the way that they jump from one thing to another. That's good. That's really good for their brain and for learning. A few warnings I wanna say, and let me find where this is so I don't miss them. A couple warnings is that it is really important that young people don't get behind in school. Okay, the reason why is because learning is based always on past learning. So remember I said impulse one, that's learning moment one. Learning moment two is a branch goes out. Learning moment three is the information rides along that pathway, making the brain stronger. But learning is always built on past learning. So if a young person gets behind, um, of course, practically, we realize, yeah, that's a bad idea. But even physiologically, it means that the brain is growing less shoots along that path. And um, so the more that we can feed their interest and keep that learning, like getting them personal tutors if they're falling behind, that's not a bad thing. My kids go to tutors in Ukraine because they're showing an interest in a subject or because a subject's a little bit harder. From my knowledge here, I'm like, you know what? I just want to make sure that they can stay up on the information because if they get behind, it gets harder and harder for them to learn. The good news is we can always learn, but watch that they don't get behind in things. We also recognize there's different learning styles and things, and so they may not be into a subject. You know, History may never be their thing, and that's okay, but now you know of this picture where if history was never the thing they were interested in, they weren't making stronger connections and stronger pathways for history. So it doesn't make the information easier to ride along um, because they weren't giving a lot of attention. The way that the brain wakes, it works is use it or lose it. Meaning you tell your brain, I'm interested in this. And this is the danger of video games and social media. There's a lot of dangers regarding those. But part of the problem is that if you have a child who's just obsessed with video games, he or she is telling her brain, this is important, this is important, this is important. So it's strengthening those pathways and it's ignoring other pathways. And so, okay, if that's what you want him or her to be into, that's one thing. But otherwise, the brain is saying, oh, all these other things that you're not paying attention to, snip, snip, cut, cut, and it's just those things aren't as strong. So we want to figure out how to make as much strong as possible in their brain. Now, remember the bad news, which is that the front connectors aren't as strong, so the front pathways aren't as developed. That comes later on. We can't always fast forward that. That just takes time. Well, guess what, that, guess what that means for us as parents and as youth leaders? That means that they really need us to come alongside them when they do need to do these functions. Think about young people keeping a calendar, keeping a day planner, filling out college entrance exams, opening up a bank account, doing some of those things that bring us into adulthood um, they can try and stumble through it on their own. I think a lot of us remember how we had to figure out things on our own. But when a loving adult comes alongside them, for example, let's say your kids are really messy. Part of it is maybe they just are naturally messy, but maybe they actually need someone to teach them. Like, listen, the pencils go here, the papers go here, and if you clear off your desk, you can put these things on it. And this doctor, she said, I was amazed. She had two sons that went to Harvard and MIT, and she said they were 18 years old, they were intellectual geniuses, but their workspace was a disaster. And she made the wrong conclusion that intellect meant that they could do these things. It's not the same. And so she sat down with them and they created like a workspace and they cleaned up their room and she actually helped them have better study habits that they didn't intuitively learn on their own. So those are some of the ways that we as adults can come alongside and kind of teach them, teach them how to clean their room. I have a son, he's 10. He doesn't know how to clean his room. And I have these high expectations that he should organize everything beautifully. And I watch him sit in the middle of this mess 
And now that I know this, I'm like, oh my goodness, his brain actually doesn't think of how to categorize all of these things. Let's do it together, Dylan. And we do it over and over again. And that's one of the great things about learning is when we do it over and over again, we can really create good habits. So here you see an Olympic skier. If you've watched skiing, snow skiing on, uh, on television, or if you've done it yourself, you know this thing of like grooves or ruts in the snow. And the more you go down the path, the deeper the grooves and the ruts get. And that's a good thing. And those are actually called learning ruts or learning grooves. And that's a really good thing. So a, a great example of that is a young person studies piano or studies Spanish. For me, the case was Spanish. Went to Spanish lessons for 10 years got married, and my husband said, we're not going to a Spanish-speaking country. I think we should go to Eastern Europe. I said, oh, no, all of those years of Spanish kind of got to put those aside. So now I've been living in Ukraine for 15 years. I don't speak Spanish. And if one of you started speaking Spanish with me, I would have a hard time being able to communicate with you. However, when I go into back to Chicago and I go into some Latino neighborhoods where there's Spanish speaking people and I'm kind of in my old element, my old environment, it starts to come back to me. And that's exactly because of this. Those connections, those learning ruts were so deep, kind of like learning how to ride a bicycle. You really never forget. So you can have pathways strong enough that you can never break that. I can't unlearn Spanish, even though I've put Ukrainian in my brain for 15 years, the Spanish is still there. So you actually don't lose some of the good habits that you had in the past. And that's great. But what if it's bad learning? There's actually a term called bad learning because the brain can't differentiate between good learning and bad learning. So let's take a simple example. Before we go to the serious problems, let's do one of saying swear words or curse words, some kind of bad words, okay? So She's 10 and she says a couple bad words and it's fine. The brain, you know, the first time she says a swear word, it's like boop, a little synapse. Second time, a shoot grows. But after many, many times of saying these bad words, a connection has been made and it becomes very hard to unlearn that habit. The brain is incredibly strong and that's how actually addictions and forms of memory. You just told the brain that was important so many times that to unlearn that bad habit is really hard physiologically. Now with the power of the Holy Spirit, with God, great, we can unlearn certain things, praise him. But what's happening in the brain is you just told the brain that was important. So now she's not 10, she's 22. She's going to her first job interview and she suddenly just starts cursing <laughs> in front of the interviewer and she doesn't get the job. And she says, oh man, I wish I hadn't had that habit, but it's very hard to unlearn. But imagine if we weren't talking about saying swear words, although that is a terrible habit. What if we were talking about much more serious things? And so now we come to another form of learning, which is in the form of addiction, okay? Now remember what I said, that the teenage brain is primed to experiment, to be curious, and to try new things. And this is where we need to introduce the dopamine receptor in the brain. So the dopamine area of the brain is a reward center. So I like to start, before we go to the really ugly habits, let's do a good example. Let's say you are reading your favorite novel or your favorite author, and your favorite author comes out with a new book. You pick up the book, you, let's say we're, we're talking teenagers, so the teenager picks up the book, reads it, remember that's new learning, so it's a new synapse, new things created in the brain, and it was a pleasurable experience, this input, this stimulus, and so the dopamine area of the brain gives off a little, like a little wow, that was great, thank you, I like that, I would like to do that again. And that's how pleasure works in the brain. Dopamine gives off a little reaction, I like that, I want to do it again. And that's great because the stimulus was a book, a storyline, something clean, something good. But then scientists realized, uh-oh, what if the stimulus is certain chemicals coming in in the form of narcotics, alcohol, 
nicotine, marijuana, and also down there, if you can see it, I have sugar on that list. Those are all chemical inputs. So like I said, it's learning. It's funny, right? You wouldn't think of that as learning, but it is. You're taking a substance, you're putting it in your mouth, and the brain lights up, the dopamine center reacts and says, wow, I like that, thank you, let's do it again. But the problem is that these substances, you learn them very fast. They have an addictive element. Now remember the problem is that the teenage brain is amazing and wants to learn and is at its ripe stage of learning. Well, that's really bad when it comes to these substances. Because what happens is that not only it's new learning, right? You take a hit of some narcotic, okay? Let's say it's just, it's as serious as heroin. They went there right away. They take heroin, goes in, synapse, dopamine, says, wow, I love that, give me that again. But the problem is that with these substances in different levels, different forms, it's not just synapse, branch, shoot, path. It's like, boom! And it's like a huge impact in the brain that says, that was so good, I want that again. And the connection that's formed is so strong and so fast that you don't even have a chance to ski down the slopes and make the ruts little by little, deeper and deeper. It goes deep fast. And so 90% of all addicts become addicted before the age of 18 because the makeup of the brain makes that connection so strong and so fast. If I were to start using heroin and you were to watch what happened in my brain, it would be different because I'm not 18 anymore. It, they get addicted so fast. And so scientists are like, oh wow, we gotta be really careful. We need to tell young people about the consequences of these substances. It, now it's not just a moral thing that we as followers of Jesus say, no, let's say no to that stuff because we don't wanna be controlled by that stuff. There's also a scientific side that says, careful, warning, this is really serious. Watch what you're doing because you can get addicted really fast. But you see on the right side, I added pornography and online gaming. So the interesting thing was that scientists made the conclusion about the chemical inputs going in through the mouth or through the veins or something like that. But then when they started to take pictures of the brain, when someone was looking at pornography or someone was playing a video game or someone was watching violence on TV, they watched the brain and they said, oh no that dopamine factor is happening again. It's not just at the outside chemical substance, it's actually a picture or an image. And they said, oh wow, this is more addictive than we think. And so addiction is just what, they, what scientists sometimes call overlearning. Like I said, the connection gets so fast, so strong, um, and it's a form of memory, so the brain remembers and asks for it again, but there's a third danger. Um, in, in the United States in the 80s and 90s, there was an ad campaign, Say No to Drugs, and it was, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, any questions? And this is your brain, they would show a real brain, this is your brain on drugs, they would show an egg on a frying pan, frying, and then they would say any questions. And I, it was a good ad campaign, I still remember it to this day. What they were trying to say is that the use of these substances actually rewires the brain. So work with me here for a second. What happens is that when you put these things in your body, not only do you get addicted, but all of those shoots and pathways, especially the ones in the prefrontal cortex that we desperately need to be full functioning adults to make good choices, use wisdom, et cetera, the brain, these substances actually rewire the brain and those connections never get fully formed. And so that's why when you've heard the, phrase, the phrase brain dead, that's a real thing. I remember when I was 15, went to a public high school and there was a group of kids who started experimenting with drugs and they went deep fast. And now today they're all dead or brain dead. Because what happened is that those drugs rewired their brain and they were never really able to live capable adult lives because they never got those, those executive functions to be able to be responsible adults. And it's really sad, but one of the most important things we need to realize, and we're gonna look at this with risk-taking, is that 
Young people have to understand that there are consequences to bad behavior. Sometimes we want to shelter them and not let them know some of the really sad stories. Like my mom worked in the emergency room and my mom would come home and she'd say, hey, I saw these kids overdose. I saw these kids get in a car accident and she would name all these bad things. And it sounds kind of negative, like, oh no, don't expose your teenagers to such negative news. But on the other hand, scientists say, no, we have to expose young people to negative news because if you don't know about the consequences and if you don't experience, the con if you don't experience consequences to your bad behavior, you are much more likely to go back and to do the bad behavior again. And one of the problems is that young people like to do new things, which often leads to risk. Now, I love this video, probably because he's Ukrainian. His name is Mustang Wanted. He was an old YouTuber. I don't know, he's probably, there's probably other people out now. But he is in Dubai, he's on a crane, he climbs up to the top, he has no ropes, he has no belts, he has no chains, he just has a camera and his arms. And so he likes to do risky things. And I like this video to show, when I show this to teenagers, I say, why is he doing this? Does he know this is dangerous? And they say, yes, of course, it's very dangerous. I say, okay, well, why does he do it? And of course they say, well, he likes the attention. He likes the likes. He's popular. It feels good. The truth is, is he knows that this is risky, but the reward and the gratification is higher than the risk of what could happen. You have to understand that adults <laughs> with the prefrontal cortex fully formed, we make decisions with pros and cons or pluses and minuses. I look at this and I say, yes, there are pluses, great YouTube channel, lots of popularity, but then I say, wow, the minus is, is that he could die, and it just doesn't seem worth it to me, therefore, the minuses are higher than the pluses, I'm not going to do this activity. Very easy, clear. Young people don't think like that. They're more inspired by the reward, and they're programmed to do new things, and so we have to give young people an outlet to try new things. Like extreme sports, I'm not against extreme sports. I think it's a great idea. But it has to be in an environment where it's not too extreme to the fact that they could really hurt themselves or they're experimenting with things that could really harm or kill them. So you have to be thinking creatively of how can I give my young people new experiences, trying new things, but also have some control over the environment. And that's really important for them um, in their development. Give them some boundaries and also share the fatal consequences of bad behavior so that they're aware of how dangerous it could really be. Now there's, I have a couple more subjects before I open it up to questions from you. And one of the subjects is relationships. You know, relationships rule in this age, in this age um, period. They're not really interested in parental authority, teacher authority, um, even sometimes church authority. They're more interested in, well, what do my peers think? What do my friends think? And relationships are really key. We can't negate that. Oh, and I forgot to mention something, but I'll just say it here. A lot of times, we as adults will say to young people, I know exactly how you feel. I was 18 once too. I was 15. I know what you're going through. On one hand, that might be true. On the other hand, the truth is, is that this generation, Generation Z, Generation Alpha, they are experiencing a childhood and adolescence absolutely different from mine and from yours. We actually don't know exactly what they're going through because they are living their entire life online. They live in a digital age that most of us remember a non-digital age. They don't. They have more opportunities than any generation ever before. They have more dangers than any generation ever before. And they have more distractions than any generation ever before. And so for us to say, I know exactly how you're feeling, we actually don't. And so maybe give them the respect of saying, I don't know exactly what this is like, but I wanna be with you and I wanna walk you through it. 
Um, and so their, t their friends do know what it's like, and so that's why they often are more prone, because their friends do, in a lot of ways, understand. Now, an interesting study was done looking at young people and saying, well, we want our young people to be really successful and to thrive, to flourish, to have a great life. And so scientists gave some advice of what can we do for females and what can we do for males to help them thrive? And it was just an interesting gender study based on different hormones and things flowing in the body. They said that for girls, one of the most dangerous, um, a, a high danger for females is social isolation. Because females are created for connection if they have a healthy friend group, that's one of the best things you can do, of course, for any young person, but particularly for girls. Because girls, when they have high stress, high emotions, the friend group, the talking, the, the interpersonal relationship, that's really good for them. And if it's a healthy group, that's really healthy for them. That's why youth group and youth leaders is really key at this age. And that's really good because a danger of isol a social isolation can really um, make their lives really, really miserable. Now for males, they said, with the hormones going on in the male body, high stress, high emotions, males need physical activity to help them bring down some of those levels. And so they say that for guys, extracurricular activities, after school activities, um, I don't even just mean sports, because it's okay if a guy isn't sporty, but it's thinking, okay, what is it that he can do to physically offload some of those heightened chemicals in his body um, so that he can better regulate? So just keep that in mind, that for the males in your life, do they have enough physical activity? For the females in your life, do they have enough healthy friend groups, and of course, give the girls the exercise too, and the guys it's important for healthy relationships, but I just thought that was an interesting split of looking at the girls and the guys in this particular area. Now, there's always stress in our lives, and we're always thinking about the future, but one way to help you love and empathize with young people is knowing that teenagers do not carry stress the same way that adults do. So we look at a high schooler who has to decide where to go to college or university, who to date, whether or not to buy a car or take driver's ed, whether or not to get an after school job, whether or not to move away from home or stay local. So we look at those things as adults and we're like, yeah, we remember going through that. Yeah, it was stressful, but we made it through, it's fine. But in the moment, those things, because they don't have the functions to regulate and to look at things rationally, it starts to build up and they get extra, extra pressured. And they start to stress out and that's where depression and anxiety is hitting this generation like never before. One of the reasons, well there was always depression and anxiety in the past, but now because of so many options for what you get to do when you're 18, and if a young person can only handle so much and you're giving them 300 decisions and options that they could make, they start to crumble under the pressure. And the answer is not, oh, come on, just be strong, buck up, you can do it. It's not that scary. The truth is, is that chemically, there's something kind of sad going on inside their brains too. I'm like so thankful for these things. Who would have known? We have cortisol, which is the stress chemical in our bodies. God created our bodies so that serotonin and something called TCH, which I don't know what that stands for, but that's what it's called. Serotonin and TCH regulate cortisol. So we're in a stressful situation, fight or flight. Luckily, in an adult body, serotonin, TCH kick in. We restabilize and we come back to a norm. Teenagers have serotonin and TCH in their body, but for some reason during puberty, it has an opposite effect. So they're under stress, serotonin and TCH kick in, and it actually heightens the stress. So now they're worse off than before because the body's upside down doing things it probably shouldn't. It's not regulating because of their age. So in stressful situations, walking through this and being side by side with young people is so key 
They don't need us to tell them all the answers. They just desperately need our emotional and prayer support and our physical presence, which is getting more and more complicated as our world gets more and more busy, right? That time is really important for them. And making decisions about the future really does stress them out. And then one last thing, I always like to throw this in because there's always debates in our youth group about multitasking. I said, well, you really shouldn't multitask. They said, we're fine. We can listen to music, watch TV, text our friends, do our math homework, and probably do a couple other things all at the same time. Now, the truth is, is that the brain can't multitask because multitasking is really just going from one input to another very, very quickly. The brain is just amazing and it can just switch, 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 switch really, really, really fast. So it appears as though we're doing five things at once, but the truth is, is the brain is just like dancing around these pathways, these synapses. It's amazing. God is amazing what he does in our brains when they're working well. Now, Teenagers say, it doesn't matter. I can do all those things. I'm fine. So this is what I tell them. This is more of kind of like a psychological experiment to help them understand. I say, okay, fine. You can do those five things at the same time. No big deal. But when you multitask, it takes you four to 400 times longer to do what you're trying to do, depending on what it is. That's a long range, four to 400 times, but that's what the study said. So I say, don't you want free time to be on your phone, to be on social media, to hang out with your friends? Like, yeah, I don't have enough time. I said, well, why don't you put your phone in the other room and give me 45 minutes here at the table, you'll be done with your homework, and then you'll be able to go back to what you wanted to do before. If you do it with your phone and with all these inputs, it will take you longer and you'll actually have less free time. So sometimes that inspires them to do it. But as we're talking about multitasking in that terrible thing called the smartphone, which now we're all addicted to, not just the teenage brain, but everybody has an addiction to their phone. I just want to remind you that if you are still the parent, parents these days stop parenting their kids far too early. And yes, we want them to be independent. We want them to make their own decisions. But at the end of the day, you are still the disciplinarian in the home. And as a mom or a dad, you have the right to say, guess what? You're not on this right now. And they'll say, come on, I need it for school. Say, yes, you do. I get it. But we're going to figure out a way so that you're actually without this device for time. And you know what? There was a cool college study that said that there was this professor and he forced all of his students every single lecture to put their phones in a box. And they were so insulted because they're like, we're 19 years old, you can't do that. He said, in my classroom, we're doing it. And they had the best semester. And they said thank you to that professor who actually instilled some interesting discipline um, on people that look like they're adults. They're 19 years old, they're living on their own. But that professor still did that and they had a really good experience. So I just want to encourage you as leaders, as teachers, as parents, you can still say no, you can put a rule um, and try it out. You'll get a lot of pushback, but at the end of the day, you might actually get some thank yous as well. Now we have just heard a lot, a lot, a lot about kind of what's going on in the, the physiological life of a young person and why it's complicated. And so when we think about our Christian response, going back to that picture I showed you also of teenagers in a gym where they said, we just don't think that adults care about us. We don't think that they really like us. I think about Jesus. Imagine if Jesus was in a gym filled with teenagers, filled with high schoolers. And it says Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And that's exactly Like, that's a great picture to say that's what this young generation is like. They're like a sheep without a shepherd. And if you've ever read Hurt 2.0 about the secret life of teenagers by Dr. Dr. Chap Clark, he was our professor at Fuller Seminary, and he said that teenagers push away, but that they're just giving out a signal. That's not what they really want. Every young person wants healthy relationship with adults in their lives. And the more healthy relationships with adults, the more likely they're not going to need 
the, the more likely they're, they're going to lead a healthy existence. Now, one thing I forgot to tell you though, and I wanna flip back over to this real quick about mental illness, okay? We can't neglect the mental health crisis that's gonna come about because of COVID, that's gonna come about because of high anxiety, high depression, lots of social media use, yeah, lots of pressure. Um, I am absolutely, I'm no counselor, I'm no psychologist at all. So when you talk to people, they say like the first signs you wanna be looking for, because your young person is go going through mood swings all the time, up, down, up, down, up, down. And that's really normal. I want you to understand what normative behavior is. But the, the doctors that I talk to, they say normative behavior stops being normative if it goes on for longer than about two to three weeks. Meaning you notice they stop eating, they're socially isolated, they're sleeping way more than normal, their personality changes. And if you notice some of those signs um, kind of jumbled one on top of the other for longer than a two week period, that's a sign that you probably wanna get somebody else involved. You, you don't have to run immediately to the doctor, but maybe getting a pastor or getting a trusted adult, somebody else to come in and to take a look um, because the interesting thing is that, as we, I just told you so much about chemicals in the brain, there are real chemical imbalances that can happen in brains that can lead to different problems. And so if, if you're noticing that something is off, something's not right, it, sometimes it is worth going to the doctor and saying, can you take, like, let's look. And let's see, because if one of those levels is really, remember we talked about the cortisol or the, the dopamine center or some of, some of the other hormones that are being secreted, if there's a serious chemical imbalance, that might, the teenager's gonna have a way harder time managing life. You wanna make sure that you can get within the norms of, of, uh, of like a healthy existence, so that's one. And the second thing that's pretty serious is that if you didn't know, um, some pretty serious mental illnesses such as schizophrenia, bipolar, manic, uh, like mania, those things usually kick in between the ages of 19 and 22. And again, it's, it's the brain and the development of the brain that's changing and morphing. And so you just, you don't want to miss those signs. And when you talk to certain parents who had kids who had a more serious condition than they realized, they said, wow, I wish I would have known the signs and I wish I would have gotten help sooner. So we don't live in paranoia, but we do wanna watch out for certain things so that we can get our kids and our teenagers the help that they need. But they say that loving adults and the lives of young people is one of the best ways to stave off um, some of these things that really start to pull them down, like depression or like um, anxiety and things, that we as adults can actually really help that. And God absolutely can help that. So as we focus back on the Lord, we see that we're gonna increase our compassion. We're not gonna put the bar too high. We're gonna kind of accept them for where they're at at this stage in life. And we're gonna help them cross over from adolescence into adulthood. And we're gonna help them as Christians. One of the best things we can do is help them figure out these three main questions that all young people have to figure out for themselves to cross into healthy adulthood. Who am I? Where do I belong? And what is my purpose? And one of the most amazing things about Christian worldview is that God gives us the best answers to these questions. Something that TikTok and Instagram and YouTubers and social media gurus cannot give them. So when we look at a passage like Ephesians 1, which is just so rich and filled with all of the, these descriptors to answer these three questions, we see that we are loved and chosen by God. Where do we belong? We're adopted into his family. We always have a place. We see that we have grace poured out on us, that he is kind to us, that he gives us wisdom and understanding. All those things we're longing for, he gives us forgiveness because we know we need it. Young people need forgiveness. And then for purpose, it says he chose us to be holy and without fault and to bring us to Jesus. And so one of the things is that we can do as adults is are we speaking enough truth, enough vision, and enough um, enough of Christ into their lives? Are we pointing them to the Father, Son, and Spirit for the answers that they need? 
Sometimes I think we default too much to practicality when the truth is, is that we need to point them to Jesus who helps them figure out those things as well. And so I'm so thankful that we have these answers in God's word. These are two of the most popular books about the teenage brain. There might be some newer ones now, but these were New York Times bestsellers. Again, like I said, these aren't based on some kind of like biblical knowledge or deep spiritual insight, but the practicality I really appreciated. And then we take all of our great biblical knowledge and understanding and kind of intertwine the two. And now this is my last slide, which is just kind of a catch-all reminder that I don't want you to forget as you leave, as you grow in empathy and grace for the young person, don't abandon them. There's something called systemic abandonment that's going on, which means that we as adults are too busy with our phones and careers and our own life plans to have too much time for our young people. And young people feel abandoned. That's one of the main reasons they say that adults don't care about them because their experience is that their parents really don't care about them that much. We think that they push us away. So as they push us away, we take two steps backwards. Whereas in reality, inside they're crying out saying, no mom, take two steps forward. But they won't show that that's what they want, but that's what they really want. So don't be tempted to abandon them. Put your phone down, practice listening, be present, do things side by side with them, that works really well. And don't panic when they rebel. I hope that this showed you like the riskiness, like the substance, like use of substances, trying new things, not being able to do certain adult functions very well. Like that's really normal. And so I don't want you to panic too much when it looks like they're starting to take steps in a bad direction. Most young people do have that period of time when they're kind of experimenting and trying new things. Walk with them through that. Don't reject them as they're doing some things you wish they weren't. Um, do you have realistic expectations for your young people? That's one of the ways we're most guilty is we set the bar too high. We want them to be perfect. We want them to achieve more than we did. We want them to become youth pastors and missionaries and amazing things. And so we start to pressure them. Remember, they're already feeling so much pressure. Let's not be ones that put that on them. Let's give them space to figure it out and that we'll support them in whatever they choose. Invest in their talents, help them grow, help them with their hobbies, and make sure you're raising awareness taking away pressures, setting boundaries. Young people need nine and a half hours of sleep. Most high schoolers do not get nine and a half hours of sleep a night. And then on the weekend, they get like oversleep because they're exhausted. You're still the disciplinarian in the home. So set boundaries for them and ultimately point them to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit because he loves them way more than we ever could, which is sometimes hard to believe because we love them so much, but God really does love them and he's watching out for them even when we can't be.